Thank you very much, uh, Jock. We move on in our program, and uh, we are extremely well on track, which I find is very important, very, very fine. Yeah, as mentioned, we have heard now the keynote presentation. We have dealt with uh, uh, the first topic of our three topics here, and that is making uh, protection goals operational, for example, with respect to uh, using the ecosystem services concept. We are now ready to move to the next topic, which is about relevance and reliability of studies supporting environmental risk assessment. We will hear two presentations under this section, one before the coffee break, one after the coffee break. Um, and I'm pleased now to ask Dr. Joe Smith from Australia to come to the podium, who will give the first presentation on this topic. Uh, the title of his presentation is Environmental Risk Assessment versus Ecological Research, the importance of a good problem formulation. Um, Joe is an, an independent advisor to the Australian government on uh, biotechnology and agricultural chemicals. He uh, was serving as the uh, gene technology regulator I think it's called in Australia yep. for five years, from 2009 to 2014. Uh, during that time, he was responsible for um, implementing regulatory, from the regulatory side, uh, the issue of uh, gene technology. Um, beyond Australia, uh, he was, was and is very active also in the international arena, so to say, OECD, FAO, WHO, and the International Society on Biosafety Research. So we are looking forward to your presentation, Joe, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Helmut, and, and thank you to EFSA for the uh, kind invitation to participate in, in this important symposium. And I think uh, I'd like to actually congratulate EFSA for the initiative in, in holding such a symposium at a time when the eyes of the world are on, uh, are on uh, Milan uh, in relation to food, and, and at a time when it's never been more important to um, consider the issues around ensuring a safe and secure food supply for the future. I guess uh, at the outset I'd like to sort of give the usual caveat in that uh, as I'm now retired um, I can make comments which draw on my experiences as uh, firstly as uh, being responsible for the agency that regulated pesticides and veterinary medicines in Australia and more recently the agency that uh, regulated, uh, regulated gene technology. And I'd like to, uh, well perhaps speaking at a more general level than the last couple of speakers, I'd like to, to look at some of these aspects from the perspective of uh, somebody who was not an ecological researcher and not even so much the person doing the risk assessments, but somebody who had to make regulatory decisions on the basis of those risk assessments and what was, what was important and what wasn't important. So just, just briefly, as I mentioned, my experiences uh, come, in, in particularly in relation to GM crops, from um, the Australian experience with, with uh, over 15 years now of what I think is an effectively functioning regulatory system for GM crops, and which uh, is uh, increasingly uh, being applied to an increasingly diverse range of, uh, of uh, crops and traits. And I think uh, in Australia, as in most other places of the world, um, been operating without any uh, valid uh, reports of concerns to uh, health, to the in, uh, adverse effects on health or the environment. So what I'd like to talk about today are three, three key things. Firstly, I'd like to explore a little bit the difference between ecological research and environmental risk assessment and perhaps build a little bit on the concepts that, uh, that Alan uh, introduced in his opening uh, presence, presentation. And then within the framework of, a, of uh, environmental risk assessment, uh, talk about what, what problem formulation is, uh, and what are some of the key factors that impact upon uh, problem formulation, how you go about uh, um, formulating problems, and then importantly the role that it plays in the overall risk assessment process. And then from that uh, I'd really like to I guess emphasize the point uh, throughout my presentation and I hope I don't repeat it too many times but, but an effective uh, problem formulation is an essential determinant of the data that regulate risk assessors and regulators need to, uh, to consider to make, to make sure that they're actually answering the questions that need to be answered when they're making these decisions. 
I think Alan uh, Gray also mentioned in, in his presentation the excellent work by by our colleagues, but particularly uh, Alan Raybold over many years, who's thought very deeply and published very widely on the on, on this subject. And and I think uh, it's it's widely accepted uh, by people in this, this audience, I'm sure, and and, and elsewhere that that uh, risk assessment is not ecological research. If if you like it, it applies. They both apply the same deductive logic in that they both address problems uh, they, and they test hypotheses. But they're fundamentally different in three key ways. They're different in the type of problems, in, in the problems they select. They're different in the types of hypotheses that they pose. And they're different in the, in the way they go about testing these hypotheses. And it's really important, I think, uh, and particularly from, from where I come from as a, as a regulatory decision maker uh, based on risk assessments, that these two um, uh, fields of endeavour, risk assessment and research, aren't confused. Because if, if they are confused, I think it will be to the detriment of both ecological risk, risk assessment and, and um, uh, sorry, environmental risk assessment and ecological research. So perhaps just teasing, uh, teasing these uh, issues out a little further and again drawing heavily on the, the, the work of, of Alan Raybould. In terms of uh, problem, the, the problem that uh, each of them is seeking to explore, in, uh, in research the problems tend to be perhaps of a, a more objective nature, uh, although there can be an element of subjectivity depending on the, the particular preferences and biases of the of the researcher, but they tend to be primarily objective and, and, and they're derived from analysis of, of what we already know, what's, what, what, what information already exists. Whereas in environmental uh, risk assessment, uh, and I was interested uh, at the, one of the uh, presentations on the, the first day, the plenary presentations, where we're talking about values and, and, and their role in environmental risk assessment. Um, Environmental risk assessment, the problem we're talking about is inherently subjective and it's subjective because the definitions of harm, when we're considering the, the, the things that we're trying to protect, those things that are valuable to people are inherently subjective things. So different people from different uh, cultures, different countries, different, uh, different environments value uh, different things. And so, so that, that's one key difference. The hypothesis that, that, are, that are established with ecological research, um, basically uh, the level, the, the degree of how interesting they are is determined by um, how precise they are, the level of precision, and how they can actually uh, be measured, how they can be tested. Whereas for a hypothesis and environmental risk assessment to be useful, it has to actually uh, be something that uh, is useful to the person asking the question at the end of it is, 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 is this particular um, product, this particular event, going to um, cause no harm to, to something that, that society cares about? So they predict no harm is the difference. In, in, in testing the hypotheses, um, research, uh, quite appropriately, it, it aims to falsify an, uh, an hypothesis but tends to do it with a lot of uh, field studies and field data, whereas uh, in ERA where you're also aiming to falsify a, a hypothesis, um, it can do it more by perhaps corroborating uh, information that's gained from, from laboratory studies. And the point I'd like to make at the, at the, at the end of this slide is that it's important, in fact it's essential, so that we do have for environmental risk assessment, a clearly defined problem so that risk, risk assessors at the end of the process and people like myself who were making regulatory decisions can conclude with some certainty that, that those particular harms will not evaluate. And if you, if you, if you don't have the problem clearly defined, it's, it, you, you quite often sort of uh, find regulators calling for and assessing data that they really don't need and all it does is serve to uh, add unnecessary cost and actually I think ultimately undermine the, the confidence that the public or the regulators um, and industry have in the outcome. So within ERA, what is problem formulation? Um, I've uh, 
taken a, a definition here which is pretty similar to Alan's, which I'm sure he'll, uh, he'll recognise because he was a co-author of the paper that I've, uh, that I've pulled this, uh, this definition from. And, and this, this work came from a, an expert group that Ilse put together um, some years ago. And its uh, lead author is Jeff Walt. And, and it, it says that problem formulation is the first step in the ERA where policy goals, scope, assessment endpoints and methodology are all distilled to an explicitly stated problem and an approach for the analysis. And the aim of that, as I've mentioned, is to, is to actually improve the focus of the environmental risk assessment, improve the consistency of outcomes and, and I think particularly importantly ensures that the outcome of the risk assessment is, is relevant and useful for regulatory decision making. There are a number of key factors that impact upon problem formulation. Uh, I'm not uh, proposing to investigate all of them in, in any great depth here, but just to note uh, four that I'd like to spend a, a little bit of time on. The first is, is legislation and regulations. The second is the risk analysis process itself and, and within that the role of, form, uh, role of problem formulation and, and, uh, and uh, particularly the risk context. And, and then uh, lastly but not least is, um, is, is the identification of, of protection goals and, and translating, importantly, translating those protection goals into specific harms rather than having... Um, trying to, to, to do a risk assessment on something that is, is very broad and, and not very well defined. And, and I guess the aim, of, the aim of this aspect of the, of the problem formulation is, is to actually remove hypothetical or, or negligible risks from the regulatory decision-making process so that you're not wasting effort and time uh, I I investigating those things. Legislation and regulations, um, I guess coming from a, a former government background, it's always something that's very dear to my heart and, and effectively what it is, it, it's the government mandate and it's what tells the regulator uh, what they can and can't take into account when they're making a, making a decision and, and one of the very first things you always learn um, when you get into this business is, uh, is uh, regulatory decisions are more likely to come unstuck because you haven't got the legislation side of it right rather than because you haven't got the science side of it right. And so in Australia, for example, if we were to make a decision regarding a, a GM crop um, which took into account issues other than those relating to human health or the environment, for example, if we considered benefit or if, if we considered impact on, on trade, um, that would be an invalid decision and it just, it, it just wouldn't... Um, wouldn't stand up. But it, 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 it's very important and it's a critical part of, of, of framing, the, uh, the framing the problem, problem formulation. It also sets the high level regulatory criteria within which you've got to do, um, got to do the risk assessment and helps, helps articulate or it does articulate who is responsible for those decisions and helps, um, helps uh, if you like, put a boundary around the scope of the risk assessment. Each country has its, own, uh, has its own set of legislation and regulations and, and in functioning democracies that should be that those, uh, those legislation and regulations reflect the values and aspirations of the particular, of the particular society. Not everybody will agree to them but, but um, that's, that's the, the intent and that's the basis. Um, this, this diagram here outlining the risk analysis process also comes from uh, the publication by uh, Walt and, and, and colleagues and uh, it's something that I'm sure you're all familiar with and, and there are variations of this diagram around, around everywhere. Important thing I want to, want to sort of emphasise from this particular diagram is that right at the very beginning of the process um, it's important to formulate the problem that you're trying to, to resolve, to, to, to study, to answer, the questions you're trying to answer. And, and it's important to formulate that problem with a good understanding of the risk context or the problem context. So uh, risk context is a, is a very, very critical, critically important uh, thing in framing the risk assessment uh, 
uh, developing the problem formulation and actually actually determining what we want to know and what we want to consider as part of the risk assessment. It's the sort of thing that uh, is very significantly determined by the regulation that you're um, that you're working within the, the, the legislative framework, but it's also uh, determined by well, what are, what are the activities that are that are being uh, conducted with the particular crop? Uh, what what are the traits you're looking at? What what else do we know about uh, about the broader environment? And uh, there's you know many cartoons here which sort of I think help convey the message of the importance of context and. And uh, I'll sort of give a couple of examples in a minute in relation, if you like, loosely to the, 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 the issue of the snake in the cage or the snake out of the cage. And it's a very, it's a very different context if you're doing a risk assessment uh, for the snake in the cage rather than one where it's already escaped and, and, and is out there. So, so one example here is, is uh, again, drawing from... Uh, from my time at, at OGTR was uh, part of the, the context considerations for herbicide tolerant canola for the the uh, commercial release of herbicide tolerant canola. It's it's which is now um, being grown increasingly in various parts of Australia and probably this year they're probably almost up to half a million hectares of um, of GM canola herbicide tolerant canola. But so the sorts of things that you consider in the risk context are obviously within the framework set by the legislation, within the framework set by the regulations, you have to consider uh, what do we know about the, the canola parent plant. Um, you know, it's exotic, annual, it's a, a weed in agricultural but not undisturbed, excuse me, habitats. What's going to be done with it? So is, is, is the, the plan is to actually do everything with it that you were doing with non-GM canola. What do we know about the traits that the, the, the genetic modification is imparted to the plant and what will be the impact, impact of that on the environment? Uh, what do we know about the receiving environment and, and uh, so what, what, what information do we also have about what previous releases of, of GM crops might be there and what, what, uh, what is also grown in the vicinity? But, but the, the risk context for this sort of, uh, of, uh, of risk assessment is very different from one that you might consider for a field trial. And so, yes, you, you have the same broad set of legislation and regulations, and yes, you're still dealing with um, possibly this, the, the same sort of genetically modified crop. But you consider that the risk assessment is done within a completely different frame. And so uh, you have to take into account at the very beginning that there will be measures imposed to limit and control um, what we, we call these things a, an intentional release into the environment. So to limit, limit and control uh, the release. Um, so you have measures such as uh, separating the trial sites via use of pollen traps or, or isolation zones. You, you have requirements, le legally binding requirements to, to harvest the trial plant separately, um, clean equipment, destroy un unused plant material. Etc. And there's a whole whole range of other things that you have to take into account. And so, for example, it's not really such so important when you're doing a, a risk assessment for a field trial to consider the potential impact from uh, eating the crop, if you like, uh, for people or animals eating the crop, if there's no intention for the for the um, for the crop to be used for animal or human feed. So it's you, you've got to sort of frame your risk assessment around around the questions you're trying to answer. And, and you might also expect the impacts on the environment to be, to be minimised because, uh, because of all the other controls that you've, you've put in place. So then, it, we, we then need to, to, to formulate the problem. And I guess here I'm perhaps uh, rehashing um, some comments that have been made by the previous speakers. But it's, it's really important to... Uh, at the beginning of the whole process to de define the problem very clearly. So going through and defining your assessment endpoints so that um, they're as specific as possible. Um, identify those characteristics which have got a potential to cause adverse effects and, and postulate some exposure pathways that where they might, uh, might occur. And I'll talk about a couple of those uh, in a moment. Um, outline some specific risk hypotheses to guide data generation and its evaluation and develop the potential pathways to, har to harm. 
uh, from doing this. So this uh, schematic sort of uh, emphasises, I guess, what I've had on the previous slide, but, uh, but, but diagrammatically. And so what we need to, to do is at the right hand end of it, we've got to sort of look at, well, what are the harms to people in the environment that might occur? It's no, no point doing a risk assessment which leaves things just in those general terms. You've got to define, define specific harms which are derived from the protection goals that you're trying to, um, uh, to, to preserve, to achieve. And what are the activities with the GM crop? And then, then within that, you've got to sort of try and then uh, develop. So this is a potential harm. This is what we're doing. What's the sequence of events that might lead to, lead to that harm occurring? And, and how likely are each of those steps to occur? So by way of example, um, uh, a, a, a possible pathway to harm that might have been considered when we were doing risk assessment for, uh, for BT cotton, which um, for those of you who don't know, Virtually all of the Australian cotton crop is, is genetically modified and has been for, for some time. But uh, one possible scenario might be that uh, um, you might lose um, some seed during transportation. That might establish um, GM cotton somewhere in the vicinity of native cotton. Gene flow perhaps could uh, could occur from the GM to native cotton, and that that might lead to increased weediness of the native cotton, and then that that might have an adverse effect on the on the natural habitat. So I'm not saying I'm not sort of here to talk about the likelihood of each of those steps, but I, what I am saying is that this is the sort of thinking that you need to go through, and then you need to ask yourself: is what is the likelihood of each of those steps to occur, and and really for something to be considered seriously as a potential risk, you've got to, got to be able to say that, that each one of those steps has a, has a fair chance of, of, of occurring. Uh, main aim of this talk is not so much to talk about data quality. I suspect Jörg might uh, talk a little bit more about data quality, but I thought it was important uh, just in, in touching on the overall approaches to environmental risk assessment and, and problem formulation, just to, to emphasise the critical importance of having good quality, relevant data and understanding the uncertainty uh, related to that data. In Australia we have a, a, a thing called a hierarchy of data quality and relevance which is published in the OGTR's risk analysis framework. But it's, it's fairly intuitive and it's fairly common sense. You know, good data, uh, re reliable data is data that's uh, um, done according to, uh, you know, uh, published data hopefully, but data that's done according to, uh, pre prepared according to uh, internationally accepted protocols. And the, the, the other end of the spectrum, uh, not good data, is, is uh, unsubstantiated claims and statements. And, and unfortunately, in the area of uh, of gene technology, a fair bit of that goes on. But we also have to ask ourselves the question, so is, is the data relevant, but also is it sufficient to answer the questions that we need to answer in the, in the, in the problem that we formulated? Um, if it's not, we have to be very clear up front and as part of the risk assessment to, to, to identify where the uncertainties are and to say that, but not, not just do it as an, as an afterthought at the end of the risk assessment, but to take it into account. Um, and, and I guess, yeah, it, it, it's, it's about quality data and, and, and I guess the, uh, the example down the bottom was, a, was an example of, of poor quality data that came out a, a couple of years ago which, which uh, through, um, uh, attracted a lot of public attention but really didn't contribute a lot to the understanding of, of genuine risk. In the interest of time, I've just decided to leave those, those last two slides out, but uh, if people are interested, I can chat about that at some stage. Um, so I'd, I'd like to leave with a few uh, summary conclusions, which uh, uh, of things that I found important when I was considering the, the value and the, and the usefulness of risk assessments that used to come across my desk when I'd have to... Uh, to uh, review them and, and make decisions. 
And the first one is, is just to clearly understand that risk analysis is not research. As somebody said the other day, you've got to make a decision. You can't sort of go on and on and on and say, we need more data, we need more data, we need more data. It's not research. But what it is, it's a structured mechanism, as the slide says, for making effective and timely decisions using the information you've, you've got and taking account of the uncertainty. Um, it's uh, problem formulation uh, is critical to ensure that the environmental risk assessment considers only those risks that are relevant and credible and of value in the decision-making process. Um, potential harms, assessment endpoints and credible pathways to harms need to be clearly identified at the beginning of the environmental risk assessment because that then shapes all of your questions about uh, I think as Alan said, is the difference between what you actually need to know in terms of data and what's just nice to know and what's, what's, uh, what's of interest. Uh, it helps ensure, problem formulation helps ensure that the data is relevant to the questions as I've, as I've just said. And, and finally, um, just to note again that credibility, quality and relevance of the data is essential. And uh, just my uh, final thing is uh, one just to say that's all personal from Joe and not on behalf of the Australian Government or any agency and, uh, and also to uh, uh, thank the staff of the OGTR who much of that was based on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe, for a clear presentation outlining uh, the important topic of um, data and information relevant for environmental risk assessment and how this differs from ecological research. A lot of uh, what you've said, I think, is food for thought also for the moderated panel discussion at the end of this session. Uh, but um, just before we break for coffee, I would uh, allow for one, maximum two brief questions of clarification. One, two. Okay. Glenn. You know, Joe, I, I want to disagree with one particular point that you made. Uh, you said that the aim of testing for environmental risk assessment is to falsify null hypotheses. And, and that's, that's, no, a, I, I, yeah. and that's a, a, a very bad, yeah. very bad a, approach yeah. to statistics for risk assessment. Um, you, you can't, in fact, uh, do a risk assessment based on conventional hypothesis testing because conventional hypothesis testing begins with the assumption that there's no effect. And if you fail to reject that hypothesis by uh, presenting data that are sufficiently uh, improbable, given the truth of the null hypothesis, yeah. Uh, yeah. you can't assume that there is, in fact, no effect. What you need to do is, is determine the relationship between exposure and response, and that's really what we need for risk assessment. Yep. Thank um, you. I, I, I'm not disagreeing, I think. I, perhaps I express it poorly, but uh, well, I think we're on the same page. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Detlef, briefly. Okay, Detlef Bartsch again, uh, BVL Berlin. Um, I'm strong, uh, as you always, with the, the topic of this problem formulation process and when I look back to the two talks we had yesterday in the beginning of, of the, the whole conference when the social scientists came in, um, how can we avoid that problem formulation is not problem generation uh, if we put in all uh, the, the comments from, from outside, what could go wrong, maybe also re relates to what Ellen said in, in, in the morning, uh, really to focus on, on the problem and not uh, to, to, to look at everything that, that is potentially possible. Yes. I'm a yeah. deep friend yeah. of, of getting public into uh, the, the, the discussion of, of uh, concerns, but um, yeah, how to avoid wow. uh, this, this broadening up and uh, to, to come to a specific focus yeah. at risk decision makers can really work with. What? Thank you, Detlef. Yeah. Joe, brief answer. Sorry, yeah, yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I hear, the, hear the concern, but I, I think the, the, the practice and the approach to it means that uh, the beginning of the typical thing with the beginning of a risk assessment at, at um, the, these agencies that I've been, would be, we'd get the application in and then there would be a, a brainstorming within the organisation and people would come up with, based on their experience and knowledge, they would come up with, a, well, what are, the, what are the potential harms that we're looking at? Uh, then, then there would be a methodical examination of uh, 
really the question about what is up to, at the very front, what is the, the real likelihood of any of these things eventuating? So you've got to look at each of those steps. And I think by going through that process, and, and I'm, I'm actually in favour of involving public uh, comment, provided um, uh, it's structured and you, and, and, and you sort of uh, manage it in, a, in, a, in an appropriate way. But I think by going through the, the problem formulation process itself rigorously at the beginning, you actually um, dis dismiss a lot of the, the sort of um, less likely scenarios right at the very beginning of the risk assessment. You don't need to do uh, a, a detailed risk assessment on all of those things that the public might raise. You can, you can sort of do a fairly um, brief one at the beginning and dismiss some of those things, dismiss a lot of them. We usually end up with, you know, uh, maybe half a dozen risks that genuinely need to be assessed. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you once again, Joe.